Hi, my name is Terry Zwick, and I'd like to welcome you to our session, Non-Destructive Examination and Special Inspection of Seismic Welding. Our speaker today, Mike Mays, graduated with a civil engineering degree from Michigan State University. His MS is a welding engineer from Ohio State. He's a registered professional engineer and ASNT level three. He has over 30 years of experience in materials testing and is an expert in welding, structural steel, and non-destructive testing. Mike is, an at, is active on several AWS D1 code committees. I would like to introduce Mike Mays. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so do, uh, if you have some questions, I'm going to leave about uh, 10 minutes at the end for, for questions. So uh, go ahead and ask away. Everybody seems to have stories about inspection that they'd like to share. So. Now, one thing Terry didn't mention, I also own a special inspection agency uh, for the last uh, 20 years. So, you know, we see all sorts of specifications, all sorts of uh, uh, fabrication and uh, lots of different products. So uh, it gives us a, a, a good worldview to uh, a lot of different issues that come up. So as Terry said, we're going to talk about non-destructive evaluation, non-destructive examination, non-destructive testing. Uh, everybody argues about what to call that. But we're going to just talk about some of the issues that uh, we see come up time and time again, uh, and then how that relates to special inspection, and then seismic critical welding inspection. After the Northridge thing, now we've, we've got some uh, rules, that uh, some, some, some new uh, codes to follow. We'll talk about that and also talk about how the approved fabricator program fits into all this. So that's, that's the game plan. So first of all, the fabricator uh, and the erector has some hand in the quality control. I mean, the code actually says, the AWS welding code says that quality control be, be performed by the, by the fabricator and erector. Uh, the, with the uh, AIC program, we have some very defined qualifications and duties of, of the QC manual. So that's the first step is, is uh, we find that if the fabricator especially has a well-defined quality program and some knowledgeable individuals, the project seems to run so much smoother uh, from our perspective and from the owner's perspective. We don't find too many erectors that actually do have a, have a separate inspector. There's a few out there, but... Uh, I would encourage, if you're an erector, to, 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 to think about this because I think it can help your work go smoother and, and get a better result. So on the other side, uh, well, not on the other side, you know, the other member of the team inspection is the quality assurance inspector, and that's typically, uh, uh, that's a special inspector. Uh, we represent the owner and the building department. So we wear this dual hat of uh, uh, the building jurisdiction has different rules that we have to follow and different different reporting uh, uh, processes that we do. How did how does one become a special inspector? Uh, there's a, there's a lot of different types of people who are in this business, but the bottom line is the the building code says that the special inspector's qualifications are going to be determined by the building department. And how does how does that happen? The, the answer is it really gets quite variable from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, so we operate on the west coast in the ring of fire, so it's, you know, special inspection seems to be, you know, quite uh, a, a bit to the forefront there. So one of the things that uh, has happened in our neck of the woods, actually uh, agencies like myself uh, have pushed the building officials to kind of group together on a statewide uh, program through Washington Association of Building Officials and Oregon uh, Building Officials Association. They actually certify all the inspectors, and they actually accredit all the uh, inspection agencies. Other places, uh, Los Angeles has a program, San Francisco has a program. I know uh, LA, uh, Las Vegas County, Las Vegas, city of Las Vegas has their own program. So when you move away from those kinds of cities, it, it gets kind of convoluted, I would say. But in in uh, Typically, there's a there's an exam that they take, and that's at least the, the minimum level level is uh, uh, 
the International Co-Committee exams. In Washington and Oregon, we actually then document the experience and we interview these people. And they have to work for a testing agency. They can't operate solo because that, that gets to be, we think, an issue. Now, NDE inspectors, they can be special inspectors, but they can also be sort of separate. Uh, if you're a fabricator in this room, you, you probably know that NDE inspectors are pretty variable. The, the talent that comes into your shop is uh, quite variable. Why is this? The reason is that each employer qualifies their own inspectors. So as you can imagine, some are more diligent than others about how they qualify people. And, 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 and oftentimes agencies like mine are run by uh, maybe soils engineers that don't know much about non-destructive testing. So you're kind of relying on the individual. So you, you end up with different, different expertise different philosophies, I would say. So what's required? The code, you know, I, I think we're all kind of merging on this uh, international building code now, uh, requires, and we're just going to talk about welding and structural steel, but it requires 100% visual inspection in both the shop and the field. It breaks out continuous inspection and periodic inspection. So typically, continuous inspection is required for uh, complete joint penetration welds, for instance. Multi-pass fillet welds, and then for seismic welding, it's required to be uh, continuous inspection. That literally means that the welding inspector is there while they're welding. So that can, it can be quite uh, a deal when you've got uh, double shifts going on in your shop. Um, now, if if we're doing things like single pass fillet welds and uh, uh, deck welding studs, uh, things like that, or if the fabricator is a, an approved fabricator, then we only have to do periodic inspection, the special inspector. Some of the things that we see is uh, as problems with, with fabrication inspection is do you have the same inspector in the shop that you have in the field? Some of the some of the worst nightmares that I've been involved in is uh, uh, coming in, especially as a third party, is maybe the work was accepted in the shop and then it all gets rejected in the field. I mean that's a that's a horrible situation. Um, there's a couple ways I, as a fabricator to to get a, to to make sure that it doesn't happen is a have a good quality control quality control person in your shop that. Is, is putting out good quality and, and also making sure that the inspectors that come in know what they're doing. And, and whether you're the design engineer or the fabricator, demand competence in your, in your inspectors. You know, and again, you need people in the shop to know if these folks know what they're doing. The requirements for non-destructive evaluation, there's, there's, frankly, there's no requirements in the International Building Code to do non-destructive testing. There's really no requirements in the welding code either. There's requirements. There's there's uh, there's requirements for how to do the NDE if it's re if it's required somewhere else. There is re requirements for NDE in the new I IASC seismic provision. So we'll talk about that. Whatever the requirements are, and typically they come in into the contract provisions in the specification S zero notes. Make sure if you're the fabricator or the erector that you know what you're up against because uh, there can be quite a wide variety in the specification of, of NDE requirements. Uh, this last uh, point, uh, frankly, if people know that their work is going to be non-destructively tested, what happens? It, it's going to be it's going to be a little better work typically. The big surprise is uh, if you don't think this is going to happen and then you 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 make a bunch of welds and then somebody comes and you tease them or x-rays them then then it's it can be an issue the code actually has a whole provision and this 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 provision is invoked quite often in in lawsuits and and uh, arbitration hearings if if the if somebody decides to do ndt and it's not in the documents somebody's got to pay some money that's that's basically what this says, and and the exception is, and we 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 argue, we seem to argue about this in code committee uh, once every three or four years. What what does it mean? Uh, you know, the exception is, you know, attempted defraud or gross nonconformance. So, 
Uh, we're still working on what that definition of gross is, but the, the, it's fair to say that uh, if, there's, if there's not ultrasonic testing or x-ray in the contract, you, you can't just impose it as an owner or, or a, you know, a, some inspector just thinks it's a good idea. So where do we get the NDE from? We typically get it from the contract documents. Typically, the, the complete joint penetration welds get non-destructively tested. Typically, it's ultrasonically tested. Sometimes, and this is not actually more often than not, I see specifications, especially the 1450 section of the specification. You know, and I know a lot of this is kind of goes from job to job, but it, there's statements in there that basically give the uh, inspector, you know, basically prerogative to do whatever he wants. I, I would argue that's a little dangerous to, to have that kind of provision in there. Specify what you want and then uh, in the beginning of the job, let's sit down with the structural engineer, the inspector, structural engineer, fabricator, erector, and let's all agree on what's on the contract and, and let's, you know, uh, who's going to do it, how it's going to be done. Saves a lot of time and aggravation. So now, what, see this is, this is the problem with, with just giving the special inspector the prerogative to do whatever he wants because there's dozens of things we can do. We're like mad scientists, you know. We we really we love this work, and, and uh, we'll keep we'll keep applying methods until you tell us to stop. The the major thing we do, is, of course, is a visual inspection. That's that's a non-destructive testing, but uh, I'm not going to really talk about that. The the main things that we do with welding are we do either radiography or X-ray, ultrasonic testing magnetic particle testing or dipenetrant testing. Some, the other methods are typically not very applicable to, to, to uh, structural welding. So radiography, a lot of people like radiography. Why? Because it's got, at the end of the day, we got a piece of film. It's, you know, it's like evidence and everybody can look at the same piece of film and make the same judgments. It's required for bridge girders, but I would say it doesn't have a place typically with buildings. Uh, a lot of the geometry for, for, for buildings, especially uh, T connections and uh, uh, cont continuity plates and stiffener plates, do not lend themselves geometrically to do radiography. There's no place to orient the film and the source to get a shot. The other, the other thing that we see sometimes is, uh, let's say we have a problem with uh, radiography or UT and then somebody has the idea let's well let's check it with the other one again this is a place where you can run into a lot of trouble because the two methods see different different things so again let's decide what we're going to use and and stick with it dye penetrant testing is another uh, method that is used with welding but typically it's used for surfaces that are ground smooth the problem with dye penetrant testing is it's quite inexpensive. It's easy to use, a couple spray cans, uh, uh, some rags, and uh, you know anybody can be a dye penetrant inspector. But if the surfaces are not smooth and, 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 and uh, ground, uh, you just don't get any very good results. So again, this is not a place that we want to use, this is not a method that we want to use for buildings, structural buildings. So that leaves us with the main methods. We've got mag particle testing and ultrasonic testing, and that's what I'll spend a little time talking about today. I'll talk about you know, what limitations they have and, and uh, what pitfalls in uh, uh, each one of these methods. The, the, the simpler one of the two is mag particle testing. The idea here is we have, uh, here's our, our steel. We have a, a, a crack or something in it. Uh, we set a magnetic field in, into the area of interest, and where there's a break in in the field by by a crack or something, we have a, like a local local magnet. So if we if we put uh, iron particles on there, basically they glom onto the crack or the opening, and we get what's called an indication. So we get a very bold, bright uh, indicator of of some break in the field, and then we have to decide if it's something. Uh, uh, crack or, or whatever it is, geometry. 
Typically, we, we use a device uh, like this, an electromagnetic yoke, so the weld's in the center. We, it's like a big magnet. Uh, so here uh, we're looking for cracks oriented in this direction. Uh, we now we have to we have to turn it 90 degrees to see cracks in the other direction because otherwise uh, we don't get that that uh, local pole set up. So here's a here's a picture of a, a technician uh, interrogating a weld here with a with a probe. We can we can kind of jazz this thing up, make it more sensitive by by adding uh, fluorescent particles. Uh, so the, actually, mag particle testing has several levels of sensitivity. So again, we have to agree what we're going to do. Are we going to use fluorescent particles? Keep in mind when you have uh, magnetic particle testing on your welds, uh, you're going to see a lot more stuff. You'll see all the little crater cracks. You'll see the the little, the little fine things that you can't see with your naked eye. But if you've specified this, if you're an engineer and you've specified this, then be prepared that you know, there's going to be repairs and, and some fixes going on to do this. So it should be reserved for a, a higher level of quality. It shouldn't be, it should be just carte blanche uh, used for, for, for any weld out there. So here's, a, here's another good indication. There's a crack adjacent to a weld. So these would be the red dry particles. So it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting when you find these cracks. They're, 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 they, they pop right up and, and uh, it's kind of exciting for us NDE people to find these because they don't show up that often. But when they do, they're, uh, they're bright and bold. So again, uh, mag particle testing, you will find more flaws. Uh, the specifications should uh, dictate what method of mag particle testing you're going to use. Just don't arbitrarily let the technician choose. We we like to use MT, especially for repairs. If we're excavating a cavity, we find for to find a flaw that uh, we found with another method. We like to use MT to to make sure we get it all out. So this is that's a good tool to have in the toolbox. This is my slide. It doesn't work on this one. Ultrasonic testing. So ultrasonic testing is the other main thing, and this is this is how we look inside the well. So basically, you can think of ultrasonic testing kind of like a sonar. Here's here's the here's the transducer that sends the sound into the well. If 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 there's nothing to bounce off of, the sound will keep going forever, and, and we won't see anything on the screen. If there's a if there's if there's a reflector in this case uh, like a lack of fusion in the in the uh, in the weld, we, we we get sound bouncing back up to the transducer. Uh, this would be the signal here. We know the distance from the transducer to the flaw, the sound path distance. We know the angle. So. Uh, my eighth grader is doing this trigonometry now, so we, you know, a little, a little bit of trigonometry. We can tell the welder, dig here, and you should find this flaw, you know, three quarters of an inch down or whatever we've calculated that to be. So here, here's uh, actually one of the field scopes. You see the transducer down here. This is a, a beam to column weld, and, and here's a big old flaw here that's bouncing off the screen. So this should be very accurate. Uh, there's different ways to confirm the flaw. The welder should actually find the flaw. It's always the big test of faith. And if they've never seen you before and you, you walk into the shop and, or the field and you start rejecting the welds, the first thing they do is, you know, we haven't, we haven't had a weld rejected in, you know, 20 years or, you know, fill in the blank. They all, they all stop working. They all come over and, and watch the guy carbon arc this, Thing out, you're sitting there sweating, and uh, you hope they find the damn thing. And, and, and if they do, they shake their heads, okay, and they'll trust you. But it, uh, if they don't, for some reason, then uh, they run your, you know, you know what out of there. Uh, the, one of the issues that we find uh, is a problem is backing bars. A lot of specifications will will say take off the backing bars for UT. Is this required? I would say no. Uh, sometimes they have to be taken off because of uh, if they're they're fit up poorly or uh, uh, the seismic uh, requirements require them to do that. The problem with backing bars, 
if you, uh, the UT guys know this, is we have trouble discerning, we have an unfused corner in the backing bar, we have trouble deciding if this, we're seeing this corner where we're seeing lack of fusion up in the weld. So there's, there's tricks in our tool basket to, to, to figure that out, but that's, that's, that's some of the controversy of this backing bar thing. Uh, the other backing bar issue we get, which is not not hard to find, if it's poorly fit up or the backing bar is you know inside of a tube or something like that, uh, we can also get flaws in here that uh, readily show up. But the real problem we have is this this whole issue of uh, uh, this corner. And also, if we want to come on this side, the backing bar gets in the way of our transducer moving back and forth. In another issue uh, we have is is the the beam web gets in the way. So you, as we scan along the beam web, we actually run into this you know where the where the curve of the uh, flange web intersection is. We actually run in this spot. And we actually have a zone in here we really can't see. And this is this is one of the reasons why we take off backing bars for lower flange seismic joints now. So now we can get it from the bottom. Uh, I've heard this called affectionately as the gimme zone because everybody knew we couldn't see it and, and this is where they're in the, in the Northridge earthquake there's a lot of problems here because uh, well I'll show you a little bit more about that. The other, some other issues with uh, ultrasonic testing is the flaws orientation if they're, uh, we have to have the flaw at some right angle to the sound path so if, if for some reason we don't we can't see it. Sometimes the access to the weld, uh, we can have other plates in the way or we can have uh, bolt holes in the way, things like that. I still see engineers put ultrasonic testing in the specifications for partial penetration welds. Don't do that. It's, it's, it's really the code is not set up to uh, interrogate partial penetration welds. There's not very many UT guys out there that even know what to do with that. Uh, we have trouble discerning the unfused part of the weld to the to fused part. We shouldn't be UT and welds if, for AWS that are less than 5 sixteenths of an inch. So if you want those interrogated, uh, we'll do visual inspection or we can do mag particle testing. Another thing that comes up with ultrasonic testing is somebody paints it and then we got to, you know, maybe we were too late and, you know, they painted it yesterday. Uh, what do you do there? We can, we can compensate for coated surfaces. So there's, there's some, there's a procedure for, uh, for for adding extra sound in for coated surfaces, it, it can be done. Some guys will tell you, no, I just can't do it. But then, what do you do? But I would I would say you can do that. For uh, galvanizing, gets a little tricky. But just you know, primer paint, uh, you can UT through that. But when we do something like that, we're supposed to ask the engineer for permission. So, structural engineers in the in the crowd, you know, that these are the kind of questions you're going to get from us inspection agencies uh, for permission. As I, as I talked about before, uh, the uh, UT technicians especially can vary from company to company. I, I think part of it is uh, the things I talked about, uh, does, uh, what's the skill and training that he gets. I always get a little worried if an inspector never finds any flaws. And if, you, if, you have a sh if you're doing shop work and you have a guy in there and he, he never finds anything, that sounds like a good thing because you don't have anything to fix. The, the, the problem comes is, is somebody down the road interrogates the wells and we find out that the guy who originally did them in the shop didn't know what he was doing. That's, that's a terrible thing. Uh, we, we, in our company, we, we, when we hire somebody, we actually have a set of samples with flaws in them. We, we, we test them. And this, this is also now in uh, the D18, which is the seismic supplement. UT technicians have to be tested on real flaws. So if you're an engineer, you should ask for that documentation that this guy uh, or gal uh, has actually been tested to this NXE. That's a pretty good test. It's taken out of the offshore industry. Uh, you've got to not only find the flaws, but you've got to you can't make too many false calls because you actually get deducted uh, in your total score. Flaw sizing. So. One of the things that came out of the SAC thing is 
Well, wouldn't it be great? Maybe we can. Maybe we have a philosophy that we don't have to. You know, maybe we can analyze a flaw, find out how big it is. I see. I see Bob Shaw back there. <laughs> uh, so there's there's a whole there's a whole thing in the seismic uh, supplement about flaw sizing, and then we can take that back to the engineer, and then we're going to go through a fracture mechanics routine, and and we don't have to fix it. It all sounds great. The problem is. There's probably about five guys out in there, the whole industry can actually do this accurately. And they, it takes special techniques, and your average UT technician is not set up to size a flaw. You cannot tell you the through wall height with any accuracy. Maybe within, it's in the top or the bottom, or I don't, I don't mean to sound negative, but that's just the truth. So uh, the industry is not really set up to find the flaw size. I would say if it doesn't meet the AWS quality code, the repair is probably much easier than going through the whole rigmarole of going through the analysis at this point. There's some new technologies out there that uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with. Uh, there's a there's a phased array which is very similar to medical ultrasound, which which gives us a lot more information. We're not sure what to do with all the information. There's automated systems that take some of the guesswork out of the whole hand-eye coordination that uh, the UT technician is up against. The problem we have uh, is trying to adapt that the, those technologies to the AWS criteria. So that's, that's the real issue. So right now we, we use phased array basically to, to help locate flaws and, 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 and if, the, if the geometry is kind of tricky. But we're still trying to figure out, as in the AWS code committees, how to how to how to put this stuff, how to use it. So right now, it's just kind of an anomaly in our business. So that this is this is one of the little automated system, and I, I've I've been trying to get this guy to work on a couple of jobs of ours, but the problem is it's kind of expensive and it's kind of hard to set up, but. Uh, there was a there was a round robin that happened after the Northridge earthquake, and these guys actually got it all right. So there was a contest. You, they paid you a thousand your a thousand dollar prize for the technician that got the highest score. Uh, the, the industry didn't do very well in this test, by the way. <laughs> so, but that that prompted this whole idea of testing people on real samples, which sounds like why didn't they do that before? But it really was kind of revolutionary in our industry. So approved fabricators. Time is here. Uh, approved fabricators are uh, also in the code. The approval is, is based on the building officials reviewing the QC procedures, period, and then periodic audits by the approved special inspector. Some some jurisdictions have said, okay, if you're an AIC certified fabricator, then you are an approved fabricator. A lot of them don't quite know what to do with this. I mean, I, I get calls from building departments, so what do we do? Is this guy approved or not? I said, well, I know, you know, he's been approved by the city of, you know, Portland, L.A., Seattle, and, you know, maybe maybe that's good enough. Because it, it's, it's kind of confusing, you know, there's not many building officials that know what to do with your QC procedures. So it's... Uh, I guess it's kind of uh, my advice for approved fabricators is it's it's on a case by case basis and it's it's really depending on the billing official, but most most of them will if if somebody else has approved them they'll follow right along. The the one problem with approved fabricators is uh, even though uh, they're an AIC certified fabricator, many of them don't do their own NDT, so you're you still got to negotiate that who's going to do the non-destructive testing. It's great for the owner because the owner is going to save money because we don't have to be there, you know, 24/7. Uh, but typically, we're in there doing the NDE. I would also argue that it's it's good to have the, ins the special inspector, the owner special inspector, in there, even if you're an approved fabricator, at least to get familiar with your quality system. So, so he's not looking at the same things in the field. He's going to trust that the QC system is working. Uh, the other issue is at the, you know, what kind of documentation is the fabricator going to do? And then at the end of the job, you may be required to send what we call the final letter, which is, the, you know, the letter that we write at the end of the job that says that, you know, everything's been done per plan to specs. So, again, this is not a clear-cut thing. 
uh, this approved fabricator business. And uh, again, negotiated on a job-by-job -job basis. But I think the AIC fabricator program is a great place to start. Most of the people that have that have at least stepped up and they got a quality system uh, that, that to start working with. Another, another issue I wanted to bring up is this whole tubular joint thing. This is probably one of the biggest issues that we get involved with uh, as far as problems. They're hard to weld, they're hard to test, they're hard to inspect. And a lot of times you see this with architectural stuff, you know, canopies and, you know, exposed things and, you know, they, everybody, the, the whole AESS thing is a different problem, but that as, as those who are fabricators in here, they, you know, this is a, you know, rectangular tubes coming in. These joints, they're, they're hard to, they're hard to sit up, they're hard to put back in. And if you've, if you've tested these things, they're very difficult to test. Uh, you can do the flats. Okay, but when you get into the skewed angles or the corners of these things, uh, there's got to be some compromise or some special procedures that are that are done to make this work. Quite oftentimes, the suggestion I have is 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 to mock up some of the joints. This is actually some mock-ups we did. For, these are huge things uh, for a bridge that we're working on, and not only for the welders but for the UT techs. Uh, we've got flaws in these things and we test out the UT guys on the QC and the QA to make sure they can find the flaws because this, this uh, NDE, this UT is quite difficult to do and again the average technician doesn't know how to do it. So I'm going to kind of finish off with some of the Northridge stuff. So as, as many of you know that we had this Northridge earthquake and we had these brittle welds that cracked. Uh, I'm only going to talk about certain aspects here. Uh, there's, there's certainly workmanship issues and there's design issues and the materials issues and welding issues, but I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about some of the inspection and the non-destructive testing aspects that came out of this thing. So as you've seen these solutions, though, there's, there's different ways that the, these things get put together now. The, the RBS is probably the more common one. The bolted end plate, I've not seen these yet. We just had a job where we use these Kaiser connections. I, I don't really have a booth out there. Uh, the side plate guys, we've seen a couple of those. They, they're out here at the show. And the slotted web, I've seen a couple of these also. All these, all these uh, joints have their own set of rules for, for not only welding, but testing and, and uh, non-destructive testing. Uh, the first thing we have to do when we have this, these seismic joints is we have to decide which, which welds are seismic critical. That, so that's going to elevate the inspection just on those joints. We don't apply these rules to the whole, the whole thing. The contract documents, so if the FEMA thing is, you know, those FEMA yellow books, they're all, you can put those on the back burner now. Now everything really should be based on the AIC seismic provisions, especially Appendix Q as far as inspection is concerned. And then the AWS D1.1, the seismic supplement, which supplements D11. So D11 still is around and we still have to follow it, but we have extra requirements just for the seismic critical welds. The engineers are responsible for using pre-qualified connections that have been tested and uh, you know the, everything is, is specified what they have to do there. Uh, he's got to review the welding procedures. He's got to put together a quality assurance plan a lot of this comes right out of the seismic provision. This appendix Q has a quality assurance plan that, that you can tailor to your job. The, the, the NDE requirements uh, for this ASC seismic, so we have a whole uh, laundry list of things. It's, it's, it's actually, it sounds like a lot, but it's a lot clearer than it used to be. We have to do MT of the K area, UT of the complete joint penetration welds, uh, MT, 25% uh, of those same uh, CJP welds, UT for lamellar tearing, MT and PT or PT are the beam cope access holes. This is one place where the, the uh, die penetrant does work because we, we typically grind these uh, beam cope holes smooth. Uh, tab removal sites, RBS repairs. This backing bar thing uh, that we talked about earlier, so they come off a lot of times now. They'll come off the off the bottom flange. We you know, and, and we do improve the inspection with this. 
So the backing bar uh, typically comes off, we back gouge, and we do MT, and then we, we put a reinforcing fillet weld there. Typically we leave the backing bar on the top flange, but we fillet weld it to the column. So a lot of people don't uh, have learned that taking off that steel backing bar creates a lot of time and mess. So we, we see some people try to use the ceramic backing bars and then and they work. There's fit up issues, there's, uh, there's a root gap issue. We've got to, uh, oops. Wrong button there. We've got to qualify the welder whether he's using ceramic backing or copper backing, but again, there's a, there's a whole other talk there. In the Northwest, we like to use these copper backing bars. Uh, we'll, again, with the copper backing, we have to qualify the procedures, control the fit up. Uh, we have a special welder qualification. If they melt the copper, typically, then we you know not only ruined a hundred dollar piece of copper, but uh, we've got to back out the copper out of the root pass. One of the biggest problems that we have from an inspection point of view is what we call the protected zone. So the protected zone varies on each one of these connections. So here we have one of these RBS connection dog bone things. And everybody did a nice job putting this all together and the curtain wall guy came in and he welded angles right across these these things. So that was a, you know, hold the fort, stop, and we cut those all off and redid them. Other issues are uh, these these edge form things. So in this case, we we're just welding here to here. We're we're not doing anything in this area. That was the compromise there. Uh, this is a quite the common one where the we put holes in here for the uh, safety cables, and typically these are put in the shop. So again, we've got to we got to think about this and maybe put the hole over here and still have the protection that the erector needs. Here's a place where we actually have these pin shots uh, from the light gauge framing into the protected zone. So we had to cut those pins out and, and, and do some rework on those flanges. The K area is, a, is a, another place that uh, has come out that we, especially on seismic stuff, we have to, uh, we've got a sensitive area here that we can get cracks uh, related to welds in this, this area of uh, poor properties between the web and the flange intersection. Sometimes these areas crack even without any welds. The other thing from inspection that we, we do is, uh, so we talked about this web flange intersection and right in here is a weld that was cut out I think from one of the Northridge um, damaged buildings and then we got slag in here. So the, the problem is that the welders, in this case, just welded up one side and then, and then went to the other side and welded up the other side. So the problem comes right in here, and this is the place where we couldn't UT it or do anything anyways, that whole gimme zone. So now as an inspector, and uh, whether we're working for the erector or the special inspector, we make sure that the, the welder actually pushes weld his, his, uh, his electrode through the access hole and actually moves side to side and it takes a little longer to do this this way. This, this, the, this, the, I've never saw these things before we started doing this, but now, now they, call, they give these guys these angel wings and they give them a nice place to stand and do the work and they can climb over and do the other side, so uh, it's a pretty easy tool. Of course, when the inspector comes, they take it all away and we, we have to do... <laughs> this is how they used to weld them. So the other thing that came out of this, uh, out of the, from an inspection QA, QC thing, is uh, out of Appendix Q, the seismic provisions, we have like a traveler that we use now for, for the welds. And uh, uh, ideally, the QC guy signs off and the QA signs off, whether we're in the shop or the field. Uh, as we move through this laundry list of things, and uh, actually it doesn't work too bad. So just to summarize, uh, I think the, the major points is uh, review and agree on NDE requirements prior to the work. That's, that's the main thing is that, you know, there's a lot of specs out there with a lot of different things. Read them and agree on what you're going to do. Uh, demand inspector competence. I'm in this business and I like to think that everybody, you know, is, is working as hard or as competent as, 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 as uh, my guys are. And I would suggest the fabricators and directors, they, you need to have 
somebody on your team that knows this business. So not only will you put out better work, but uh, I think you interface uh, a lot better with the engineer and the inspector that way. So with that, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Involved with the inspection of any traffic signal poles with a mast arm connects to the pole, and do you have any words of wisdom about that connection? Well, yes. <laughs> uh, well, and they're all; those are all made a little differently. But uh, oh, repeat the question. So the question was: uh, uh, mast arm poles, uh, the base, or the whole thing? Yeah, so the, the base becomes problematic because it's typically they, they sink this thing in there and, 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 and a lot of those are, are uh, you know, bitter design, so uh, they have their own ways of doing things, but uh, uh, that joint can get kind of tricky in there, the base, the base to pull, and also the, the, uh, the, way, they, the way they make the tube itself, it's, it's, it's typically a male-female thing. And there's and there's partial penetration, full penetration. I don't I don't know what the problem is. You like you know, there are problems with those. I'm not sure what the, we can talk about that after maybe if you. <laughs> any any questions about non destructive testing or things that you've seen? You say that we face the rate could be something that turns in the right on the problem and the result not yeah, the, is, there, is there a, any work towards uh, having that as a standard? And how much time do you think it would take up to, to have a phase array, for example, as a standard technique? Well, we, we're, we're using phase array right now for flaw sizing because that's, that's where it really gets uh, easy to, easier to use anyway. So the, the flaws, because you can do the tip refraction quite easily with it and really, and really map out the flaws and you have the permanent record. Uh, w there's a, there's a couple units out there that do both. I mean, you can, you can switch it over to phase array or do the, do the, uh, do the, the regular, um, AWS interrogation. So that, that's where we're at with it. But, you know, as a code body, we're not, we're just not quite sure what to do with real data. Because right now we do we compare everything to us you know the side drill hole philosophy and, and it's a you know is that it doesn't have any relation in the world to fracture mechanics or critical flaw size so I, I think I, I think I don't know how fast that can go I mean there's a lot of inertia to to say what's going on now is not broken. Because I, I'm especially in fatigue and fracture. Yeah, you, you you like to have the data, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so we would be very, very interested for fitness for service. Of yeah. Things to have and I really think part of the problem there is, so his question was phased array, you know, and why, why can't, when, how fast can we use it or when can it be adopted? But uh, it, it's out there. I think you've got to get more people using it. And I think the equipment is getting cheaper so people are buy it now. And I think that's, that's part of the issue. It doesn't cost $50,000 anymore. You can buy a machine for 20000 So. They don't work on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, you know, in the West Coast, it's, it's taken pretty seriously. I mean, we, we negotiate, you know, that continuous inspection on every job. And, you know, and a lot of it depends on what the fabricator's capabilities are. And, again, we'll, if, we, if we think it's a good fabricator, he's got a good QC program, we'll go to the building department and say, hey, you know what, we don't have to do continuous inspection here because these guys are doing the day-to-day -day stuff. So. I don't. I don't know what they're doing out there. I. I. I, I know it, it. might be a little less strict because people just don't know. Just fell in. Is there a way to expect a multi-pass fillet weld in a key joint for underbeam cracking? You know, there are. You could UT things like that if you thought there was a problem. But again, you're into specialized techniques. Uh, uh, you, when I say don't UT fill welds, you know it, it's just that the code doesn't have a has a doesn't have a procedure for it. It can be done if the 
If, if there's if there's cracking, typically in my experience, it comes to the surface eventually. Uh, and in a situation like that, whether you have laminar tearing or underbead cracking, it typically finds its way out to the surface, and you'll find it either visually or with mag particle testing. Uh, you mentioned that the crack is going to find its way out. Is it any uh, period of time? Well, it sort of depends. It depends on the and the stress, and, and typically welds crack right after they cool. But you know, unless we're in a fatigue situation, which we're typically not in a building, so that you know, when the crack, when the when the weld shrinks, that's when we tend to crack. That's the biggest load that the weld has. So you're typically safe looking for cracks right after fabrication. In the way back there. Air shots. We Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think just not doing it uh, puts you at a disadvantage because you never know who's going to be on the other end looking at And so you, and you have to have a, have a meeting in minds in the shop. And I would, you know, my suggestion is always at least have the owner's inspector come in there periodically to see how good your quality is so that, you know, things proceed and he's not going to be dinging you out in the field. Yeah, well, the engineer record is just trying to save some money. <laughs> but I think some of that, that I think that's cheap money that, uh, that should probably be spent in some form in my in my. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe at the prefabrication meeting you could bring that up and, and make that statement that you really want to have that done. Yeah. In the site of the application, Seismic provisions, actually the code says that you can't, you can't let the, uh, you can't do the approved fabricator. You have to do a continuous inspection. So that's, that's actually in the seismic provisions that you have to do inspection. I, I've always thought that that's a you know we can we can do that the way we want to. I mean, either every fourth weld or 25 percent of each weld. It doesn't really say. Uh, I mean, well, it it's not not prescribed, but it, typically you try to spread it out amongst the amongst the welders if you can. Some engineers will also include, because it used to be an old coal provision, that we can actually decrease the, the UT to 20, from 100% to 25% if the welder's got, what is it, 40, 40 welds with less than 5% reject or something like that. So. Well, I don't know. Is, that's also in the seismic provisions. It does say that it does say it does say it does allow you to drop to twenty five percent. But how you how you spread that twenty five percent is I think mean, left up to the inspectors. Probably just a couple more. Uh, from a inspection standpoint, how do you break these drop in HSS joints where you have complete contraction joint both specified on the drop in uh, the drop in member where you have the staggered joint? So, so explain that again. Joint penetration weld that has a step in it on an HFS member. So it's the, the two joints are prepped with a, with a step in the middle of, of the drop in piece. So they, it allows you to put the backup bar in on both sides of the joint and just drop the in between you know, two uh, node members and they expect complete joint penetration. Not weld there, but it's not a continuous. But, oh, because you have the. 
one step, one direction, one the other direction. So it just kind of passes over, you know, each other. Not seen that. I, I haven't run across that myself yet. I mean, this whole backing bar thing inside the tubes is a, you know, a big deal sometimes to even make the backing bar, especially in the fish mouth type of thing. But that's not what you're talking about. Maybe you can show me that after. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, Terry, are we about done here? Okay. Well, thanks for your attention, and uh, I'm glad uh, the rain pushed you all in here or something. Big crowd.